May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is good to see you all, <clears throat> even those who don't know me. My name is Father Mark. And I served here for three years as the parish deacon, and probably for three or fours before that as the subdeacon. Uh, and I'm really glad to be back among you. This is my first time being celebrant for the entire service, so give, give me grace. Um, I, I want to start as we're looking at the texts that have been given to us today. Um, and when I was thinking on this um, and praying about it this week, I really wanted to talk about sin and the seriousness of sin. It's always a good sermon when you talk about the seriousness of sin. Um, and I had this broad, overreaching concept. And I was praying, um, and God seemed to direct not just sin in general, but we need to spend some time dwelling on what comes out of our mouths. Scripture tells us that out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Um, and that's a serious thing. It's a serious thing that we open our mouths and instead of proclaiming the glory of our God, uh, we cause injury to him and to our brothers and sisters and we spoil our witness to the world at times. Uh, and because of that, Christ has come. Has he not? So I, I want to look for a moment. We're going we're gonna to traipse through as many scriptures as I can this morning, starting in Psalms. Uh, and Psalm 85 says in verse 9, For his salvation is near to those who fear him that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall flourish out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. When it talks about salvation being near to us, that word has, has such incredible richness beyond what we as English readers, pick up immediately, I think. You know, that, that word both talks about the salvation of our souls and the eternal realities of what Christ has done for us. Um, but it's not a word that gives us the hope of a fire insurance plan. It's a, a word that gives us the hope of full and total healing. And that's, it's the same word in the Greek that we see translated English both salvation and healing. And the healing is not just for the time to come, although it will be in total then, and for this time as well. Our Lord loves us so much. He would not have us walk all the way through life bearing every burden and mark of the sin we have created and committed and those sins that have been committed against us. He loves us too much for that. And, and this is an important concept, too, in that psalm, where it talks about the reason salvation is close to us is so that his glory may dwell in the land. How great it is a thing that God's glory dwells in this land because of us. That's a, a lifetime worth of meditation there, that our presence in an area brings his glory to that land. And it's not just glory to the people who are lost. It's glory to everything there. In Ephesians 1, Paul starts out 
and he says this. He's talking about those saints in Ephesus, and in verse 7 it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. I've been spending some time in a really excellent book that I would commend to you if you haven't run across it. Um, it's called Misreading Scripture Through Individualistic Eyes. Has anyone run across that before? Yeah? Yeah? Um, it's, it's really great. And in there it talks a little bit about the fact that the Scripture, looking at it from the cultural viewpoint of the East, is riddled with patronage language. A patron and a client, and the patron does things for the client that the client cannot do for himself. And the client has responsibilities. He has relational responsibilities to the patron for what he's done. And that word grace is one of these words that highlights and brings to the forefront the patronage of God for us the loving care that he would take action on our behalf when there's no reason for him to, and there's nothing we can really give him back. The, the word grace that we translate is this specific word, the, the gift of a patron. And, and in that setting, the responsibility of the client, who are all of us, is not to give things back to the patron because we can't. It's simply not possible. It's beyond our reach. It's to turn around and tell everyone else what the patron has done for us. I think you all are focused on that this summer. You've got some relational evangelistic classes and training going on. Evangelism is done at its fullness when we try not to convince others of the truth of God, but we bear testimony. We are faithful witnesses, as our liturgy tells us, to what God has done for us. So what's the end goal? What's the end goal that's brought up in all of this? If I can find my marking again. In verse 9, St. Paul says, making known to us by the gift of this grace, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. This is really getting to what our words do and how we use them and how we are present in the world where God has placed us. Christ is reconciling all things to him. He's reconciling us, and not just us, which as Westerners we all hear us, me, each one of us individually, but us as a group, He's reconciling our neighbors who are lost. He's reconciling our brethren, not here, spread throughout the world. He's reconciling the wood that makes up this pew to him. And the hands of a son or a daughter of God, this has been reconciled to him, that it would serve him well. He's reconciling the spiritual authorities reconciling all things, both in heaven and on earth. So what we do with our voice, it matters so much. It matters. So let us put away all speech that does not honor our Father in heaven. When he's talking, St. Paul, when he's talking with the Ephesians, when he's talking with a community that's given over to the service of God, he says this in verse 15. For this reason, 
because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. That word faith there, it's, it's a word that at least growing up, whether the people who taught me intended it or not, I had connected with belief of mental ascension to the reality of God and his kingdom. And again, we run into scripture and it's so, so much deeper. That faith is action that comes out of belief. Are our lives filled with faith? When it comes to the words of our mouth, do you struggle? By which I don't mean, do you have things come out of your mouth you wish didn't? I mean, are you working out your salvation with fear and trembling? Are you mindful of what comes from your mouth? I have been reminded of it recently here in the last month or so, and later on I'll bear testimony to that. So what did Paul want for the Ephesians, for those who are given over to the love and service of God? In verse 18, it says, Having the eyes of your heart enlightened. This is his prayer for them. That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might these things, to know the hope to which he has called them. It's a small thing for us to be saved. It's a small thing to know of our own salvation, and it is too small a thing. Look at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. When Mark starts his Gospel, he starts referencing the gospel. And he says this in verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We haven't even gotten far enough into the testimony to find out what as Westerners we tie into our individual responsibilities and we all are culpable for it. It is our responsibility to walk with God. This is a much bigger thing. This is reconciling all things in heaven and on earth to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The gospel is that God in Christ has entered the world and all things, all things are being made new. The hope to which he has called us. <clears throat> and the riches of his glorious inheritance of the saints. It's astounding. Various places throughout scripture we're talked about the riches of his inheritance. We're talking about as the displaying of the wisdom of God before the heavenly host. I don't know about you, but I'm a mess. And it's a great relief to me that someone once reminded me that in the service he has called me to, in the good works he has prepared me to, for, he took into account my foolishness and my ignorance, my stupidity. He took into account my rebellion. How good it is that he has called us to this. He has called us to be riches for him. Look down at your hands for a moment. We're Anglicans, right? So we do things physically. Look down at your hands. And as you look at them, I want you to consider this. You are riches for him. And he delights in the work of your hands. Do you consider that? 
He delights in the work of your hands so much as his love for you. Finally, Paul wants them to know the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. And he grounds that in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, who he has seated at the right hand of God. How can we possibly let our lips utter things that do not honor the one who has claimed us for his riches? There was a group called the Moravians in the 15th century, 14th century, and um, they were incredible for outreach. At one point, there were so many people out in the field, missionaries going out from congregations, that for every 80 people sitting in a church, there was a missionary on the field. That's incredible. That's a lot of people going out to the world. Um, and while two of them were leaving on the ship, they called something back to shore. And Bishop Mark has taken his own little take on what they said. And this is, this is what he said to us, the leadership of the diocese, when he was encouraging us to plant churches, to go out into the world testifying to the riches of the graces that have given to us in our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, the lamb who was slain is worthy of the rewards of his suffering. The lamb who was slain is worthy of the rewards of his suffering. And part of those rewards is the salvation and healing of us the reconciling every word that comes out of our mouth to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we look at the gospel account in Mark, Mark's account of the gospel, it starts out like this in verse 7. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He's called the disciples who will be appointed apostles to go on his behalf to the world. And those apostles would start consecrating bishops like Timothy and Titus. And those bishops would lay hands on priests and deacons. They would baptize and they would confirm and down through the ages, just as God passed his spirit from Moses to the 70 elders, so the spirit that has been placed on him has come down to us, both in our baptism by the mercies of God directly and by the sharing in the body of Christ. It's part of the reason why it's very specific in the prayer book. When you come for confirmation, the bishop lays hands on you. It's the ordination of the laity. But you too, just as all who have come before us, would go out into the world proclaiming the gospel making disciples, that the church would baptize them. We're part of this. And what we do with the words of our mouth is part of it. And, and before I tell you about what God has been doing <clears throat> with me specifically, I want you to pay attention to the next verse. <clears throat> verse 8. It says... He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts. <clears throat> Friends, this is completely beyond us. We cannot control the words of our mouth. It's not in our power. If it was in our power, we wouldn't need a savior. We wouldn't need Christ. But because it is not in our power, and because Christ loves you in the fullness of time, 
he came, born of the woman, born under the law, that all would know God through him. He doesn't ask us to do this in power. He specifically tells them, take nothing except a staff. One of the great things that St. Mark gives us in this is he's actually walking through the Lord's Prayer, or um, Psalm 23 in this section. And Jesus is living out Psalm 23. And with every interaction, another step is taken. And this particular one, where you take nothing but a staff, is connected with his rod and his staff. They comfort me. The words of our mouth will only be governed and praise him continually if instead of relying on ourselves, we rely on him. I'm part of a group, um, a clergy care group, and one of the things we've been invited to in this last month is to continually attend to Christ's presence with us. The, the church fathers talk about this as union with Christ. Um, you might have heard it uh, in prayer, um, prayer that is seeking union, a loving gaze from us to Christ and him back to us. That's a prayer without words often. It's dwelling with him. And we were told as we're going about it throughout our days, be mindful of are you in the will of Christ? Constantly be turning back to him as if he's right beside you or right in front of you, looking at him for all guidance, for all aid. And when I started this out, I was shocked. There were two days. It was like a gift to him at the beginning of this effort. We've all, we've all covenanted together and set our hearts towards this, that we would live life from now on this way. And for two days, he gave me the gift of, I did not go more than five minutes without being mindful of the presence of Christ. Those days were so sweet. They were incredibly sweet. And his constant attendance to me, my thoughts, the words of my mouth, as I was at work, speaking to people, speaking of people, worried about what people thought of me, they were sweet because my words were taken captive for the glory of God. Not to protect any insecurity I had. Not to accomplish my own purposes. Nothing of me. They were sweet because they were words for God. And I would get done at the end of those days and I would lay in bed and I'd think to myself, this has been such a good day. My heart is glad and I am filled with joy because my mouth has confessed the glory of God. I said they were a gift at the beginning of this. It got much harder on day three. For all of us in our group, it got much harder. And as we've talked to the people who are all over us, they've told us that they sense a spiritual pushback towards us, that we would be kept from living life this way. We're, we're coming to a time of prayers for the world and for confession. And then we'll come to the peace. I'm going to give us a moment, not too long because I don't actually know how long I've been talking to you now. But I'm going to give us a moment to attend to the Spirit that whatever's coming out of our mouth these days that is not worthy of us because of the riches of grace he has poured out on us. I'm going to ask him that he would let us know it and that in confession we would set it aside and pick up that burden no longer. He does not desire us to labor under that. 
join with me in prayer. Father, I ask for us and for your whole church that you would have mercy on us. That we would not strive under our own efforts but receive your yoke. That we would be carried up, buoyed and directed by your spirit. That you would heal us and save us. That the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.